I'm Philip Sabin, and this video shows a full playthrough of my free solitaire or team game Combined Arms, which models generic battalion attacks in the second half of World War II. Combined Arms is the latest and most developed version of a system which began with my Fire and Movement game in my 2012 book Simulating War and which has also spawned my ultra-simple solitaire platoon attack game, Take That Hill, a deluxe boxed version of which has been published and used by the British Army as a training aid. As we discussed in more detail in a presentation at the Connections Online Showcase event a year ago, Google Sabin War Games for the link, the distinctive feature of all these designs is that players must apply classic principles of fire and movement, advancing some units for a decisive close assault, while other units fire to suppress the enemy and stop them cutting down the exposed advancing forces. World War II doctrine manuals confirm the crucial importance of fire and movement, arguing, as shown here, that if the enemy is dug in, Covering fire seldom kills him. It merely makes him keep his head down so that he's unable to shoot back. Although many board and computer games offer a far more detailed model than I do of the varying weapons, forces and scenarios in battalion-level World War II combat, the only ones I have found which do proper justice to the suppressive and temporary effects of distant fire on dug-in enemies are the now little-known figure rules produced by the Wargames Research Group half a century ago. My designs aim to re-emphasize the key importance of fire and movement tactics within simple and accessible generic games which use gridded boards to avoid the imprecision and ambiguity of ungraded figure rules. My freely downloadable Combined Arms game includes full-colour print-and-play components, as well as a cyberboard game set, which allows easy play on a PC screen. However, I prefer, whenever possible, to play my designs using miniature figures on 3D terrain and this video showcases my new figure version of Combined Arms. Figure gamers often dislike gridded, especially hex-gridded, rules because of the need to create a gridded mat in order to play. I have based my new Combined Arms mat on the 13x9 hex grid which has become standard for a wide range of tactical board game series using modular terrain tiles including Battle Cry, Commands and Colours, Hold the Line, Horse and Musket, and Memoir 44. This allows the same hex mat and terrain modules to be used for upscaled versions of any of these games. Although the six-sided combined arms board is only 7 to 11 hexes wide instead of 13, the playable area is easily delineated using rows of model trees. What makes Combined Arms endlessly replayable despite its single generic scenario is my simple system for random terrain generation within the rolling European farmland in which the contest is set. Two dice are rolled for each of the 70 hexes not on the central road, with a total score of 8 indicating poor going, 9 a low crest, 10 a wood, 11 a wooded crest, and 12 a farm. On the battlefield which I generated for this refight, no farms appeared, but the other terrain features were present in average numbers. The pinecone bushes indicate poor going, but the individual pinecone trees, not marking the board edges, are purely for visual effect. Judging lines of sight for fire on distant targets is the bane of tactical land wargames. Since each of my hexes represents an area 150 metres across, I overcome the problem by ruling that targets may be seen only if within 750 metres, five hexes. This has the advantage that potential obstructions will always be one or two hexes from either the firers 
or the target's hex. So, there's no need to lay a ruler between hex centres, as in other games, and one may use my diagram instead to see, for example, that a unit on the wooded crest on the right cannot see or be seen from the nine hexes marked with a cross. Although 6mm metal figures would have been less over scale, and would have allowed me to have every real soldier and vehicle portrayed individually, as in my print-and-play counters, I opted instead to use 20mm plastic figures and models, each of them representing three or four actual men or tanks. This is partly because these larger figures look more imposing, and hark back to those in Charles Grant's book, Battle, which was my wargaming inspiration over half a century ago. Also, by trimming the circular bases of the figures from Axis and Allies games, and mounting them in strips of three to represent each rifle section, I can easily tip them from a standing to a prone position after their platoon moves, fires, or is pinned down by enemy fire, hence doing without unsightly markers. As in my conversions of the Horse and Musket and Napoleon at Waterloo games, my terrain is in a smaller scale than the figures, as a reminder that the ground scale is much greater than the size of the figures would suggest, coincidentally exactly matching Charles Grant's scale of three inches for every 100 yards. As a change from the usual Allied assault on German defenders, I opted to base this refight on a German attack on the Eastern Front. As usual, I have three companies, each of three rifle platoons, with different companies being distinguished by the stance of the NCO figure in the lead section of each platoon. The angled placement of my German infantry sections is an artifact of the best facing of their figures when falling prone, and has no game effect because only armour uses facing rules. I also have two platoons of medium machine guns, a company of Panzer IV tanks, a dedicated mortar platoon on call, and an initial suppressive artillery barrage. The defenders in combined arms are usually run by simple AI rules, partly because it's frustrating for live players to be constantly pinned down and starved of active responses, but also because the AI option allows easier simulation of the fog of war than in opposed games. Every single crest, wood or wooded crest hex in the middle three hex rows and in the top three hex rows, because they have more such hexes in this instance than the bottom three rows, contains a possible Soviet platoon. And hexes with clear fields of fire contain possible anti-tank guns into the bargain. I show this using single infantry sections and small gun models from Axis and Allies. I have no idea at the outset how many or which of these potential Soviet positions are real. The game's victory system balances this variability by giving me points for every real enemy position present. So I may lose the game either by too cautious an attack against a flimsy defence or too bold and impatient an attack against a strong one. Developing a plan is key in combined arms as in real war, and I decide that I will focus all of my forces on and to the left of the road, instead of braving the wide expanse of open ground on the right. Phase one will be to take the central wood as quickly and cheaply as possible, using covering fire from the road and an assault over the crest to the left. Phase two will see the victorious assault company and my panzers setting up an advanced firebase in and around the central wood to support a drive by my other two rifle companies along the ridge on my left. Phase three will involve my least damaged rifle company continuing the advance back towards the road, with the other company giving overhead supporting fire from the occupied ridge and with my panzers moving up to help 
while staying to the right of the boggy ground in the valley between the crests. Phase 4 will see my lead units exploiting off the board edge into the enemy rear, while those further back suppress any flanking fire from the wooded crests on the right of the road. Hopefully I will not suffer delays and losses which prevent me from carrying out this decisive final stage of my plan. The simple play sheet summarizes key game rules and allows tracking of turns, losses and ammo expenditure. To avoid play becoming too luck dependent, I use the circular track to record every hit I suffer and every fire attack by one of my rifle platoons, with the platoon involved being broken or withdrawn due to ammo depletion whenever the marker cycles back to zero. After 20 turns, around 2 hours, Soviet reinforcements are assumed to arrive, forcing me to cease advancing and to consolidate the positions I have reached. On turn 1, my Panzers and MMGs enter in the centre, with the lead Panzer platoon taking advantage of the road bonus to move two hexes forward. Rifle Company D exploits the dead ground provided by the ridge on my left to enter in concentrated formation, ready to jump off for its attack on the central wood. The first platoon of Company E enters the poor going on my extreme left, ready to probe cautiously forward over the ridge, without exposing the rest of the company to Soviet mortar fire. Since units in my rules may never fire or call in mortars after moving, my preliminary artillery bombardment now comes into its own, to stop any enemies able to see my advancing forces from ambushing them and gaining initial fire superiority. On die rolls of 2, 4 and 3, all three potential Soviet positions are suppressed by my supporting guns. The downside is that I still have no idea which, if any, of the positions are real. My platoons become fresh again, but as my artillery barrage lifts to allow my advance to continue, the Soviet defenders also recover. On turn two, I decide to risk advancing my lead panzers next to the central wood, to see if it is defended after all. My leftmost panzers, meanwhile, climb the ridge spur, and are joined there by the whole of D Company, since this crest will be crucial in providing overhead covering fire once my assault troops block the line of fire of my MMGs. The company is horribly vulnerable should I fail to suppress any Soviets in the central wood, but it is shielded from other potential Soviet positions by the rest of the ridge. A second platoon of E Company enters the hex vacated by D Company, but I opt not to advance the lead platoon as yet, so that I may focus on my Phase 1 objective for now. My lead MMG platoon calls down mortar fire on the eligible woods hex not next to any of my forces, and then both MMG platoons open fire on the other woods hex, taking advantage of the fact that my unaccompanied panzers do not block their line of fire as my infantry would. The only applicable modifier is minus one for MMGs firing at two or three hexes range. So each platoon needs to roll three or more to pin any defenders. On rolls of six and four, any Soviets in the hex remain well and truly suppressed. My trailing panzers now fire on the first woods hex. Unlike MMGs, they must deduct one for every hex of range, but this is offset by plus one bonuses for the panzers being just far enough from the enemy not to have to button up, and for the Soviets being unrevealed and not next to my forces. My roll of five falls to four and pins this hex also. On a roll of one, my mortar fire lands in this woods hex and in the other woods hex into the bargain, but there's no need to dice for effect 
since any defenders have already been suppressed by my direct fire. All my platoons regain fresh status. Since none of my infantry are within the five-hex line of sight of fresh potential Soviet positions, there is no chance yet of an enemy mortar bombardment. Hence, I now roll to see if any defenders are in the woods hex next to my lead panzers. The score of one rises to two because the hex could contain AT guns, but still falls well short of the five or more needed. So only the other woods hex remains a potential Soviet position. My lead panzers are just four hexes from the nearest wooded crest on the other side of the road. But the minus four range modifier means that any AT guns there would destroy my panzers from the front only on a roll of six, so they remain hidden in hope of getting a better initial shot. On turn three, I send the lead platoon of D Company down off the crest to attack the central wood. I would have liked to send the accompanying panzers forward with them, but the poor going prevents this. The lead platoon of E Company hence crawls forward to see over the ridge, since the, if there are no Soviets in the nearest crest hex, I can risk sending the panzers over the ridge next turn to join the assault on the wood from this firmer ground. My MMGs may not leave their initial hex due to the weight of their guns and ammo and the real-world need to guard my start line against counter-attack by a non-AI adversary. But I send the accompanying panzers two hexes forward along the road to join the lead panzers in preparing to deliver covering fire against the wooded crest. I need to stop firing my mortars and MMGs now that my assault troops are closing in on the wood. So the rest of D Company and its accompanying panzers provide overhead covering fire from the crest instead. However, they need to roll five or six respectively due to the added penalties for the partial obstruction caused by the rest of the ridge and for the panzers not being part of D Company. On rolls of 5, 5 and 4, any defenders are suppressed regardless, but I must increase my infantry ammo fired to 2 on the circular track. My spent platoons recover, but on a roll of 5, an observer on the enemy ridge calls down mortar fire on my E Company infantry, who have shown themselves at last. I now dice to see whether the central wood contains any Soviets after all. On a roll of three, it proves to be unoccupied, and I'm glad that I did not spend even more precious time and ammo securing it. Soviet troops in the crest hex nearest to the lead platoon of E Company would open fire now themselves, since they would hit my unit on four or more at this range. But on a roll of two, this hex too proves to be unoccupied, apart from the rapidly retreating mortar spotter. No fewer than three potential Soviet AT gun positions on the other flank could knock out my panzers on the road on a roll of six. But these are not quite good enough odds for them to reveal themselves. Hence, the only fire I suffer this turn comes from the enemy mortars, which, on a roll of six, pin down my E Company platoon and inflict one loss. On turn four, I am pleased to be able to move on to phase two of my plan, but frustrated that the Soviets have so far proved elusive, avoiding any losses during my textbook assault on the central wood, and leaving my static MMGs irrelevant for the rest of the battle. I advance D and E companies and their supporting panzers to confront the enemy-held ridge, while F Company enters as a concentrated reserve force. My central panzers reverse back past the poor going, ready to pivot left and join the main thrust on this flank. The enemy mortars never fire on successive turns. 
and although no potential Soviet positions are suppressed, only one has a sufficiently lucrative target, the two lead platoons of D Company, to open fire if it is real. Its role of three rises to four due to the possible presence of AT guns, but this is still one short of the score needed to reveal a real Soviet platoon. With half of the possible enemy positions on this flank now shown to be phantoms, I'm beginning to wonder if Soviet defences are actually so weak that I will need to speed up and assault rather than simply mask the woods on the other side of the road if I'm to earn enough points to prevail. On turn five, I countermand the redeployment of my central panzers and send them forward again to prepare for a more direct thrust along the road if required. My units may not enter the five central hexes on either kinked side edge to avoid exposure to off-board enemies. So I send E Company and my leftmost panzers down off my ridge ready to assault along the length of the enemy ridge, while F Company moves up in support and D Company concentrates in the central wood to provide covering fire from the flank. The lead platoon of D Company calls down mortar fire on the nearest remaining potential Soviet position, but does not yet engage it directly so as to conserve ammo. The shells land perilously close to E Company, but on a roll of four any defenders are pinned down and so prevented from opening fire on the concentrated target now provided by D Company itself. On a roll of one, the Soviet mortars are unavailable, and no other potential Soviet positions have a tempting enough target to open fire, so my forces take no further hits for now. On turn six, I gamble on advancing the bulk of E Company with its supporting panzers next to the unknown Soviet position even though my mortars will have to cease fire due to my troops' proximity, and D Company, three hexes away, offers a poor substitute. I hold my other infantry back on my own ridge for now, to avoid provoking supporting fire from Soviet troops further back. D Company's two front-line platoons now expend two more precious ammo points to cover my assault even though the extra penalty for a different rifle company being next to the target means that they will succeed only on rolls of six. Their rolls are three and six, so the effort is worthwhile, and I avoid the nightmare of a close-range ambush by unsuppressed defenders. The Soviet mortars are called in again on a roll of six, and focus on the most lucrative target of D Company, in the central wood. On another roll of three, the Soviet position on the ridge turns out to be yet another phantom, despite the plus one for possible AT guns. So my ammo and time have been wasted yet again. At least by holding back my following infantry, I do not tempt other Soviet platoons to open fire. But on the worst possible scatter roll of three, the enemy mortars hit the whole of D Company and the reserve platoon of E Company into the bargain. My two rearmost platoons are pinned down and suffer a loss each on rolls of five, but those in front have a lucky escape from the overshooting shells on a roll of one. On turn seven, I advance E Company with its supporting panzers along the ridge while sending the whole of F Company forward across the valley between the crests. D Company calls in mortar fire on the potential Soviet position which might otherwise engage the concentrated target of F Company. On a roll of three, the position is duly suppressed as my many spent units recover. The last potential Soviet position along the ridge itself is masked from D Company by the adjacent crest, but it must test to open fire on E Company. Its role of two reveals that it too is unreal, which is actually a relief since its location would make it difficult to assault. 
No other Soviet positions are revealed this turn. On turn 8, I begin phase 3 of my plan much earlier than I'd anticipated, thanks to the lack of resistance encountered so far. E Company advances to its planned fire position at the end of the ridge, while its reserve platoon moves up across open ground, and its accompanying panzers drive right to bypass the poor going. F Company reaches the shelter of the ridge I've seized, while D Company's reserve platoon advances into the central wood. D Company continues to call down mortar fire on the next position I need to take, while my central panzers engage the nearest wooded crest, now that any Soviets there have targets tempting enough for them to open fire. The net modifier is minus two, so on rolls of three and six, any enemies are suppressed for now. On a roll of two, my mortars again pin down any Soviets on the nearby crest, so with the enemy mortars unavailable on a roll of one, there is no Soviet fire this turn. On turn nine, I decide to risk a hasty assault on the nearby crest straight away, in the interests of time. So I advance the lead platoon of E Company into the boggy ground between the crests, while the reserve platoon and the whole of F Company move up behind. My mortars must cease fire to avoid hitting my assault troops, but the supporting platoon fires overhead, while the panzers pivot left and join in, since the enemy is on a crest. They need rolls of at least four and five, respectively, so on rolls of three and six, the infantry ammo is wasted, but the panzers inflict the suppression desired. My other panzers again engage the wooded crest across the road, and on rolls of four and six, they too pin down any Soviets there. The enemy mortars remain unavailable on another roll of one, but on rolls of six and four, my assault troops at long last discover the first real Soviet platoon, complete with 76mm AT guns. It is lucky that my mortars and panzers suppressed this strong point during my advance, and now I face the challenge of destroying it as quickly but securely as possible. On turn 10, I advance my supporting platoon down to reinforce my assault troops, and move F Company up to occupy the vacated crest hex. I also advance my rightmost panzers, two hexes, down the road. D Company calls in mortar fire on the wooded crest hex, and my trailing panzers continue to engage it just in case though on a roll of one they fail to pin down any occupants. Rather than assaulting the known Soviet platoon at once, I opt to fire on it, both with my assault troops and with the reserve platoon and its accompanying panzers, thereby minimising the risk of failing to keep it suppressed before a two-platoon assault next turn. My assault troops roll a six and would have destroyed the strong point had I risked allowing them to close in unaided. But as it is, it is only pinned down, and I must expend two points of infantry ammo rather than one. The really bad news is that my mortars roll a one and fail to suppress the wooded crest, so I must hope that it is actually undefended, like so many other positions which I've taken already. To add insult to injury, the enemy mortars are available again on a roll of six, and an unsuppressed observer on the wooded crest calls them in against my most concentrated infantry target, namely F Company. At least the wooded crest turns out to have no other defenders on a roll of one, and no other potential Soviet positions have a lucrative enough target to reveal themselves. However, on a scatter roll of one, my nightmare comes true and the enemy mortar shells land not just on the whole of F Company, but on E Company's two assaulting platoons as well. Both effect rolls are six, so all five platoons are pinned down and suffer a loss, with one of F Company's platoons being broken as my loss marker cycles round to zero. 
As the contest reaches its halfway point, this grave setback risks becoming even more disastrous if I cannot keep the Soviet platoon suppressed and stop it engaging my panzers and pouring close-range fire into all four of my stricken platoons. On turn 11, I've moved my trailing panzers forward onto the road, while two platoons of D Company move right, so that the leading one may see, and hence call down mortar fire on, any of the remaining Soviet positions in future. My mortars must cease fire for retargeting. The one D Company platoon, still fresh, engages the wood on the enemy board edge. It not surprisingly misses due to the net minus four modifier at this extreme range. But it fires so that it will be the unit withdrawn as my infantry ammo marker cycles back to zero. The reserve platoon of E Company and my two unmoved panzer platoons now all fire on the revealed Soviet platoon. The infantry need a five or six, but they fail on a roll of one, at the cost of one more point of ammo. Both panzer platoons need a six, because the closer one must button up due to the nearby Soviet mortar fire. But I rejoice when their rolls of three and six keep the enemy platoon suppressed after all. After the spent platoons on both sides recover, the potential Soviet position in the board edge wood is tempted to open fire on my panzers on the road, which exposed their side armour as they pivoted for their successful attack. On a roll of one, no AT guns are present, but it is still possible that the wood holds Soviet infantry, so I replace the green AT gun marker with a red one to show that an enemy platoon will now appear only on a roll of six, rather than the four to six needed hitherto. On turn twelve, I realise that the Soviet defences really do seem to be unusually weak, so I must rush to roll up any platoons remaining on the other side of the road if I'm to have any chance of game victory. I decide to send a D Company platoon probing forward across the open ground to tempt remaining enemies to open fire, while all of E and F Companies, except my two assault platoons, redeploy right as quickly as possible, together with their accompanying panzers. My other panzers drive two hexes along the road to complete phase three of my original plan as swiftly as they can. The D Company platoon, still in the central wood, calls down mortar fire on the board edge wood to suppress any Soviet infantry or mortar spotters there. My two E Company platoons now belatedly assault the Soviet strong point, each needing three or four to suppress it and five or six to destroy it. On rolls of six and three, the Soviet platoon and its AT guns are finally broken, at a cost of two more points of infantry ammo. However, my mortars roll yet another one, and so fail to pin down any enemies in the board edge wood. To my dismay, the Soviet mortars are called in again on the battered F Company on a roll of five, since breaking an enemy platoon myself just lost me the balancing minus one modifier which applies if I have had more units broken. On a roll of six, my probing D Company platoon draws fire from a second Soviet platoon in the remaining wooded crest hex. Its net modifier is minus two, so on a roll of four, it just manages to pin down my platoon and inflict a further loss. I will not learn if there are also AT guns in the hex until I move adjacent or expose my panzers to attack. The vulnerability of my other infantry companies unintentionally reveals that the unsuppressed board edge wood does hold a further Soviet platoon, after all, on a roll of six. Like mortars, defending platoons engage clusters of two or three hexes, so the new platoon opens fire on F Company at minus two and the reserve platoon of E Company at minus three. On rolls of five and three, 
the two surviving F Company platoons are pinned down and suffer one loss each. The Soviet mortar bombardment now arrives into the bargain, with a scatter roll of four luckily carrying it onto the ridge behind rather than onto E Company as well as happened on turn 10. On a roll of six, F Company is suppressed even more firmly and suffers two further losses. On turn 13, my growing belief in the weakness of the Soviet defences has been rudely shattered by these multiple surprise blows. But I determine grimly to try to destroy both new enemy platoons in turn, if time allows, while also exiting enough units to tip the victory scale in my favour. I advance E Company and its supporting panzers, with the two leading platoons occupying the crest hex which they just cleared, ready to charge on and assault the board edge wood next turn. The fresh D Company platoon in the central wood again calls in mortar fire on the board edge wood, and to avoid a repeat of last turn's disaster, the two panzer platoons on the road engage it as well, needing scores of four and five respectively, because both are buttoned up due to the enemy mortars. On rolls of six and two, the Soviet platoon is pinned down, with my mortar fire merely confirming the fact on a roll of five. The other Soviet platoon re-engages my D Company platoon and just keeps it pinned down on a roll of four, inflicting one further loss. On turn 14, I advance my two E Company platoons for a textbook flank assault, using the wood itself to shield them from the other enemy platoon. The rest of E and F Companies move right past the panzers while D Company's unspent platoon moves back out of the central wood to a position from which it can just see the wooded crest, ready to retarget the mortars against it next turn. My mortars must cease fire as usual, but all of my panzers deliver frontal covering fire on the board edge wood, each needing five or six, since E Company is now next to the target, but the more distant panzers need no longer button up. On rolls of two, six and five, the Soviet platoon remains firmly suppressed, ready for my infantry assault to strike. On a roll of four, the enemy mortars are unavailable this turn. The unsuppressed Soviet platoon rolls a six and keeps my nearer D Company platoon pinned down, taking my losses to the brink of costing me another broken unit. On turn 15, I advance my panzers to close with the board edge wood, in case the assault fails, while the rest of E and F companies continue to move right into the dead ground behind the first wooded crest. The unspent D Company platoon at last calls in mortar fire on the other Soviet platoon, to allow their pinned comrades to escape after their long ordeal. E Company now assaults the board edge wood, and on dismal rolls of one and two, the worst does indeed happen, with the defenders not even being suppressed. My mortars scatter to hit the adjacent crest position as well as the other Soviet platoon, and on rolls of six and five, both are pinned down. To add to my woes, the enemy mortars arrive yet again on a roll of five, targeting D Company's beleaguered platoon since this is the only infantry which is in view of a fresh Soviet position not next to my own units. The reprieved Soviet platoon in the board edge wood first attacks my panzers with improvised close-range AT weapons, needing five or six since the panzers have no accompanying infantry. On a roll of four, their attack just fails. They now engage E Company in the open with no net modifier, and on a similar roll of four, both platoons are pinned down and suffer two losses each, breaking one platoon. As some meagre compensation, the Soviet mortars roll a one, so my D Company platoon is unpinned and avoids further loss after all. On turn 16, my key priority is to recover the advantage in the fighting around the board edge wood. 
I advanced a reserve platoon of E Company to make up for its lost comrades, while moving D Company's battered platoon and the survivors of F Company into the lee of the first wooded crest. My D Company spotters continued to direct the mortars onto the other Soviet platoon, while all of my panzers fire to pin down the enemy in the board edge wood. The two adjacent panzer platoons need three or more, while that further back needs a six due to the penalties for the infantry in the way. On rolls of five, four and one, the Soviet platoon is definitively suppressed once again. My mortars pin down the other Soviet platoon on a roll of three, so there is no Soviet fire this turn. On turn 17, I move D Company's lead platoon onto the wooded crest, while F Company and the two panzer platoons on the road circle round the far side to prepare a last-minute assault on the other Soviet platoon. My D Company spotters keep up the mortar bombardment of this platoon for now, while my remaining E Company platoons launch a renewed assault on the board edge wood, this time with the support of the other adjacent panzer platoon. On rolls of 1, 3 and 6, the Soviet platoon is suppressed but not yet destroyed, because assaulting panzers destroy only AT guns, not infantry. My mortars pin down the crest position adjacent to their target on a roll of 2, but on yet another disastrous roll of 1, they leave the other Soviet platoon itself unscathed. At least the enemy mortars are unavailable on a roll of four, but on a roll of five a second AT gun detachment is present after all on the wooded crest, and engages the exposed side armour of my leading panzers at three hexes range, needing only four or more to break the platoon at a stroke. On a roll of two my panzers again have a lucky escape but the Soviet platoon now fires on F Company and the closest platoon of E Company, pinning down all three platoons on rolls of four and six and inflicting three more losses. Eliminating these Soviet strong points is proving much harder and costlier than I had hoped. On turn 18 I persist regardless, not moving any of my platoons and concentrating instead on firing and recovering from suppression. I continue my mortar bombardment and pivot my leading panzers to engage the AT gun platoon as a backup, along with fire from the D Company platoon on the other wooded crest. On rolls of six and four, the Soviets are suppressed again, whether or not my mortars succeed, at the cost of one point of ammo. My other two panzer platoons assault the board edge wood in support of the single E Company platoon still fresh. On rolls of 6, 3 and 6, the defenders are broken at last, for a further ammo point. My mortars have no additional effect on the already pinned AT platoon, and with the enemy mortars unavailable on a roll of 4, there is no Soviet firing. Although I will lose one victory point for each of the final two turns, I have much more to gain from carrying on. On turn 19, I progress at last to phase 4 of my original plan. F Company advances belatedly to assault the AT platoon, while E Company occupies the board edge wood. My mortars cannot continue firing, since none of my infantry can walk them to the Soviet position in the adjacent crest hex, a useful tactic during assaults, and one which the Soviet mortars employed against me on turn 10, when their shells scattered onto my assaulting forces. I hence engage the AT platoon instead with overhead fire from all of my panzers and from the D Company platoon on the nearby wooded crest, needing six for the furthest panzers and five or six for the other three platoons. On rolls of six, five, three and six, the enemy position is well and truly suppressed at the cost of one more ammo point. The enemy mortars have their last hurrah on a roll of five, since both sides have now had two units broken. 
They cannot be targeted on F Company directly since it is next to a Soviet position. But they can be, and are, called down on the D Company platoon on the adjacent wooded crest, using exactly the tactic to which I just referred. To my great relief, the scatter roll of two means that they just miss my assaulting troops, and on a roll of six they suppress and inflict a loss only on the target platoon itself. On turn 20, my two panzer platoons on the road exploit off the enemy rear board edge, while the two surviving platoons of E Company also exploit off, since they begin in an edge hex adjacent to the road. It is now time for the crucial final assault by F Company on the Soviet AT platoon. As usual, rolls of three or four will cause suppression, while rolls of five or six will break the defenders. I score six and one, so the enemy platoon with its AT guns is destroyed in the nick of time. One of my assaulting platoons must be withdrawn, as the two ammo point cost makes the marker cycle back past zero, but this is immaterial in view of the huge gain achieved. With the Soviet mortars having fired last turn, there is no final enemy fire. But in order to calculate my victory score, I must now test to see whether any of the remaining potential Soviet positions are real. The chance of this is lower once three platoons or two AT gun detachments have already been revealed, as they now have, so as to dampen undue variation in Defender Force size. It turns out that all three remaining Soviet positions, two with possible AT guns, are phantoms and that I have broken all the defenders who existed. This is bad news in that I will earn no more points for overcoming a strong defence, but good news in that I will earn points for every exploiting unit, and not just those up to the number of broken defending platoons. I receive two points for each of the two enemy AT gun detachments broken, four points for each of the three enemy platoons broken, and two points for each of my four exploiting platoons. I lose two points for each of my own two platoons broken, and two points for playing the last two turns. This gives me an overall score of 18, leaving me an agonising two points short of the victory threshold of 20. I was unlucky on several occasions, especially with regard to the contribution of my own and the enemy mortars, but I can also see in hindsight that some of my tactics were suboptimal, especially given the vulnerable concentrated targets which my infantry often presented. The beauty of combined arms is that it lets you hone your tactics in an environment permeated by dilemmas, uncertainty and calculated risk where you never know exactly what you're facing until it's too late. The simple die rolls which govern combat, force dispositions and terrain generation create a dramatic and highly variable contest, and the AI and victory rules make for a balanced and challenging solitaire or cooperative team game. Combined Arms does include an option for a player to control the defending platoons, and decide where to conceal them and when they should open fire, thereby creating an interesting battle of wits. My original fire and movement game in my Simulating War book has player-controlled defenders as standard and allows them to leave their entrenchments and manoeuvre to counter the attackers if desired. The book also contains my simpler urban warfare spin-off, Blockbusting, which I still play regularly using Lego buildings, as shown. I have recently added a simple variant to model fighting in rubbled cities like Stalingrad. These are just a few of the dozens of often freely posted games and game conversions I have designed, covering conflicts from antiquity to the present day. For more details, watch the other videos on my YouTube channel and Google Sabin Wargames to find my website with all the links you need.